Okay, so normally this is my like favorite lecture to give and um, and obviously because it's like my rantiest lecture of all. And so I hope that we can have like a nice discussion after this. I'm not gonna give like a really long version of this because hopefully you all have read the paper by now, the fossil capital uh, paper written by Andrea's mom, which is what a vast majority of the, the first half of this lecture is. And then we'll talk a bit about fossil fuels, but I know we've like talked about, about some of that before. Um, and uh, so I won't spend too much time on that. I really wanna focus on the link to capitalism. Before we get necessarily to all the sort of fine details, um, I, I wanna mention this book on the economy of machinery and manufacturers by Charles Babbage, which was published in 1832. So in class, we learned that the first paper on like the greenhouse effect was 1896, right? From, um, from Arrhenius. But as early as 1832, this is the first time someone was like, hey, maybe all this like industrialization and shit is causing climate change. And so this is an important sort of historical moment because a lot of people think that we had no idea what we were doing. Well, we, that, you know, that, that, that industrialists had no idea what they were doing, but they, they did, they were warned, they knew about it. And there are other really important sort of historical factors at play, which created the um, situation, which is, you know, what we have now, which is climate change due to fossil fuel extractions. So don't let, uh, don't, don't let people lead you to believe that we just kind of naive, naively stumbled into this. We kind of known what we were doing all along. It's just that capitalist interests have always overridden other interests. So mom says, and right at the beginning of, of this text, that global warming is the unintended byproduct par excellence. Um, a con manufacturer of mid 19th century Lancashire who decided to forego his old water wheel and at long last invest in a steam engine erect a chimney and order coal from a nearby pit did not in all likelihood entertain the possibility that this act could have any kind of relationship to the extent of our sea ice, the salinity of the Nile Delta soil, the intensity of the Punjab monsoon, the altitude of the Maldives, or the diversity of amphibian species in Central American rainforests. I love this quote because it <coughs> traces climate change. <laughs> um, I think someone has their microphone on, sorry. Uh, just make sure to mute yourself unless you, you want to say something. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. I'll just mute actually. Everyone. Hang on. I can mute everyone, right? That's yeah, you can oh, just float on their window and mute. Wait. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, back to back to back to where we were. Um, all right. So, so climate change is in fact a result of a deliberate. Uh, transition from the prior economy, uh, which utilized energy from water wheels, to an exploitation of fossil fuels. You can link it directly, as Andreas Malm has done. Um, parts of his uh, theory, his historical theory, are debated, and other parts are are sort of factual. As any good historian. Um, you want to summarize the previously done research and then kind of come up with your own historical interpretation of what happened. So take it with a grain of salt, but I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about this interpretation. And I also think that, um, that it's, it's very uh, timely and relevant. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Also the book 
was initially recommended to, to me by a, a historian friend of mine who is an environmental historian at the University of Chicago. And so um, I, I do think it's like a very good account of, of what happened. So um, prior to, you know, any industrial revolution, if that's what we want to call it, I hate the word revolution, but prior to any of this, coal is not a new thing. Coal was in use way before the 1800s. Uh, the Romans were using coal as many as a thousand years prior um, to power, to provide light and heat, right, for homes and lamp posts. And in fact, even the famous baths in England, um, in Bath, England, um, the temple was powered using coal as long ago as like the 1200s. Okay, so the Romans were using coal. It's not that we just discovered coal and that's how the Industrial Revolution happened. There's, that's some historical revisionism when people say we discovered coal in the 1800s and like it just was inevitable that we ended up with climate change. That's not really the case at all, right? So <clears throat> prior to though the Industrial Revolution, coal was used very sparsely as heating or to power lamp posts in the city of London, for example, or in these temples, that sort of thing. So very sparse usage of coal. And it wasn't until coal and the combustion of coal specifically was coupled to the rotation of a wheel, right? That the leap was made from coal as like a source for heat and light in a very sparse setting to its ubiquity across the globe that, 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 that it is now, okay? This is why the steam engine is widely identified as the sort of fatal breakthrough into a climate changing world. It really was the invention of the steam engine by James Watt, where he coupled the steam that's produced by burning coal, right, and, and running water over it, that steam turns a wheel, and then that wheel can be used to generate mechanical power, electricity, okay? When coal was coupled to that rotation of that wheel, that's kind of like the beginning of the end, if you want to think of this as the end. That's kind of sad, but... Um, so that was really where things went off the rails, to use another metaphor, okay? But the leap to coal from water power wasn't a straightforward or necessarily a given during the early 1800s. So in the 1700s, right, and I'm hopefully just summarizing some of this for those of you, for hopefully all of you who have read this, and for those of you that have not read it, you're getting a little, little extra summary now. Um, but I think that the article is pretty straightforward and has like a pretty, um, so I'm just kind of like using direct quotes, but, and some pictures that I found. Um, but in the 1700s, the cotton industry, we're focusing on the cotton industry, which is particularly important also because the roots of modern capitalism, modern capitalism, I'm putting them both in hand quotes, um, air quotes, because they're not necessarily real, real things, um, can be traced to coal, as we're talking about today, and also, as you'll see, as you saw in the article, coal led to links with labor, which leads to links with slavery. And so the other root of our sort of modern capitalism is, of course, slavery. Much of what we have in terms of capitalist economics today is rooted in fossil fuel extraction, and centuries of slavery. And those two are, are inextricably linked. And the primary link is the cotton industry. So the cotton industry in 1700s England used water as a source of energy to power water wheels. So again, we have a wheel. The wheel is generating electricity, which is powering a cotton mill, not unlike this cotton mill on a river in England. This is kind of what, what they would have looked like. And you have a water wheel probably behind this, somewhere over here. Um, so a real central question for historians then is, 
in the writing of this type of history is why did the British cotton industry switch from water to steam? I'm gonna walk you through the beginning part of that. I'm not gonna get into all of the details because you have read the, the paper and I want us to have a discussion so I don't wanna give away like the whole punchline, but uh, we'll walk through some of the thoughts around this. So one of the thoughts, which is pushed by uh, three guys, Wrigley, um, Richardson, and Malthus. Some of you may be familiar with the word Malthusian. That comes from Malthus. It comes from the same gen general tenet, these ideas, which who argued that prior to the exploitation of fossil fuels and coal, and specifically, our economy was an organic economy, meaning that all of the resources that we were using were organic in nature, trees, water, blah, 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 right? There are some holes that Andreas Mom pokes in this, namely that coal is also organic. So I don't necessarily buy this explanation, but I think it's important to consider this explanation from a historical perspective, the context of this. So this argument is that a growing economy will inevitably get trapped in fierce competition for scarce resources, making a permanent radical increase of industrial raw material supply a necessary condition for modern economic growth, very difficult to obtain. They're arguing that the dependency on the land puts a low ceiling on industrial production. So one of the ideas behind capitalism is that you must have unmitigated growth that everything must always be growing. For example, a recession or a depression is literally defined as not growth. <laughs> so if the economy is not growing, that's considered under capitalism a very bad thing. Capitalism only exists and can only be sustaining if there is unmitigated growth. So the argument is that if you run out of resources, you can't have growth, so this will put a cap on growth, okay? And Wrigley argued that a state of stagnation, right, when you run out of resources, will necessarily be rendered permanent by the laws of nature, which have limited the productive powers of the land. And that coal offers a chance of escaping the Ricardian curse. Okay, Ricardian, sorry, not Richardson. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this idea, right, was um, doubled down on by Malthus, who came up with a sort of Malthusian component to all of this, which is now derided by pretty much, pretty much everyone. Um, just a note on that, if you've seen these memes of like, dolphins in the Venice canals or some shit like that. And then people are like, oh, it turns out we are the virus. That's Malthusian. That's a Malthusian perspective. And basically what it's saying is that human beings inherently through a biological ur urge need to reproduce, that we can't help ourselves. And so it puts the blame of everything on just like the human as a, as a species, as an entity. This is Malthus. Okay, this is uh, no longer an accepted uh, belief, but I'm putting it in here because this drove a lot of historical theory for many years about how the Industrial Revolution started and, and could be some of the explanation of how we've ended up in this mess, right, that we're in now. So basically, Malthus, Malthus is arguing that people want to reproduce inherently, it's a biological urge, and that population on the eve of the Industrial Revolution exploded, and so that there was just this innate need for more energy, that we just needed to use coal because our limited organic resources like water and trees, like if you're using trees and, and logs for heat and uh, for, for fire instead of coal for fire, right, then you're gonna run out of trees. You're gonna eventually tear down the whole, cut down the whole forest. And so, He's arguing that this was, it was inevitable that we would switch from, um, from water and, and, and forests to coal because of our inherent need as a human species to reproduce. Uh, and so this is um, fucked up, for lack of a better word. 
sorry. Um, and so a really more fundamental problem of this whole entire paradigm lies in it's the way it explains itself, right? It says something like, there is this constant appetite for more energy. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, Britain specifically finally managed to satisfy it. So this is the derivation of the term Malthusian, if any of you have ever heard it and kind of knew what it meant, but didn't really understand what was being said by like Malthusian ideologies, this is it. So anytime you see a meme that says like, we are the virus, uh, you can just be like, my angsty climate change teacher said that you're full of shit and here's why, because Malthusian economics is like not a real thing. And that it's kind of fucked up, honestly. <clears throat> so for all of these people who are proposing these things, the fossil revolution um, resembles the fulfillment. <laughs> Tino, can you grab it? Sorry, my dog is uh, barking at the guys who are working now they're next door. Um, so, so um, thank you. So the fossil revolution, uh, the industrial revolution, resembles the fulfillment of this historical destiny. So rather than sort of a rupture that's separating like pre versus post, um, there are no laws of motion specific to the fossil economy, no emergent imperatives that compel economic agents to combust fossil fuels and only an opportunity to realize age old universal forces, laws of nature, basically the nature of humans to want to, to reproduce. So then why, if this is not true, right, did we end up transitioning to a fossil economy? And I'm not gonna walk through every detail because uh, the reading is long and he is very detailed and I think he does a really good job of walking you through this, but I will give kind of the general, you know, five minute synopsis of how this, this happened. So the transition from water to steam, right, from, from water wheels to coal did not occur because water was scarce or less powerful or more expensive or that humans were reproducing too much or that we were going to run out of forest. To the contrary, steam gained supremacy in spite of water being given, being abundant, at least as powerful and actually cheaper. There's a lot of evidence that water power was actually cheaper in revolutionary England, right? In the 1700s and early 1800s during the time of the American Revolution, right? None of this has, uh, has ever been disputed by anyone, but it's still deep in this mystery of why did the transition occur? So this is the historical reference frame for why did the transition occur. And for those of you who read the, the, the reading, um, actually my laptop is sitting on top of the actual book itself, but the book, this book, Fossil Capital, goes into even more detail than the, the paper that he wrote on this. And the argument is, let me see if I can sum this up in like, two minutes and then hopefully we'll have like a conversation about this but the argument goes when you use water as a resource right you can't achieve unlimited and unmitigated growth because you need your labor feet pool to be where the water is and when you use coal you can actually control the labor wherever the labor is, whether it's in London, whether it's in Manchester, or whether it's in one of England's many colonies in the early 1800s, namely, right, the United States, what became the United States, which for a long time, while it may not have been an explicit colony of England, was still a, you know, uh, de facto colony in that, early 1800s America was relying pretty heavily still on England for a lot. Um, and that included technology and the usage of coal. And then it turns out that coal was discovered in America 
um, close to the 13 colonies, making the shipment of it relatively inexpensive. So even though it's actually more expensive, right, to mine coal and bring it to your city, this transition still happened because you can control the labor market, right? So ultimately the transition to steam power offered capital the ability to discipline labor through relocation to setting, settings with a high surplus population. So, oh, we have a big city, let's put a, 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 a manufacturing plant in that city, a lot of labor, we can, just, we can just work through labor quickly, like if someone's pissing us off, find a new person, right? And then bring the coal there. And then, blah, 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 let me go back to this quote. Um, enabling capital to seek out the most profitable pools of labor power to level down wages and to enforce an accelerated and regular industrial output. The natural end to this insidious and devious decision, essentially, to switch from water to coal and then thereby control the labor market is colonial slavery, actually, right? Where not only are you controlling the labor, uh, I mean, it's like not only are you bringing the coal to the labor and you're able to control the labor, you are literally controlling the labor because you own them, just like you own everything else in the process. So the general adoption of high pressure steam power in British cotton production after 1850 entailed the increasing dependence of economic growth upon a steady expansion in coal supply. So one begets the other, begets the, the, the other. So you have capitalism, and this is a very, 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 very simplified explanation of this, but you have capitalism, which has decided that it will be better to achieve unmitigated growth by controlling the labor market rather than the resources. Switching to coal, which is more expensive, in an effort to control the labor, because if you control the labor, you can have unmitigated growth forever, basically, was the theory. I think we're now reaching the point uh, where we are, well, capitalism maybe, not we, but like capitalism and the people who are sort of um, making those economic decisions, we're reaching the natural end of this process, which is that you cannot have unmitigated growth forever, and you cannot even control that coal isn't also not an unlimited supply of unlimited resource there's not an unlimited supply of coal right so we're kind of and, and oil and, and gas so we're kind of at the the end of this where the capitalism was promised unmitigated infinite exponential growth forever and uh the way to do that was to switch to coal control the labor market but now even that might um, might not be working out, so to speak. So I know this was a really, really, really simplified explanation um, of the reading, but does anyone have any questions or comments? There will be time for us to chat, hopefully at the end of all of this too, at the end of this little brief lecture. So does anyone have any initial comments or thoughts? No, okay. Let me finish the, the slides and then I hope that we'll come back to this and I wanna hear your, I wanna hear your thoughts on like, first of all, what, so be thinking about this. Do you agree with this formulation of, of how the, 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 the uh, capitalism and fossil fuel extraction are linked? Do you agree or disagree? And what makes you, you want to agree necessarily? Like what is the sort of, what are the details that, that you buy? And then also, how do we get out of it? And that's what I really want to have a conversation about. How do we break the cycle? All right, so what are fossil fuels? I think we've talked a lot about what fossil fuels are, but just to, to summarize, right, there are three main types of fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal. Um, here's where they all are. So here's where all the oil reserves are, the natural gas reserves, and the um, coal and oil and gas, natural gas. I can't remember which ones I said. They seem to be concentrated in a lot of the same countries, Russia, United States, Canada, China, the Middle East um, are, are pretty big producers of nearly all the fossil fuels. There are some countries that have a lot of one particular type, like Venezuela, for example, has a lot of oil. Um, 
you know, the United States ha and Russia and Iran have a lot of natural gas, um, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, but in general, um, this is how the, the, the resource allocation looks across the, across the world. Looking specifically at um, where gas, so we know that most oil reserves are found, uh, the vast majority of, of oil on the planet is either Russia or, or the Middle East um, in the OPEC countries, but gas, natural gas and coal, China has a lot of coal, as you can see in this map right here, right? So this bottom right map shows where all the coal basins are in the world. You can see that China has a lot of coal. Australia has a lot of coal mining. Same with the United States and Canada and Russia, as well as parts of Europe. But natural gas is really the big, um, the hot, the sort of the hot item right now because of our ability now to frack natural gas um, from places where we previously could not, could not get it. So for those of you that take or are interested in taking my environmental disasters course, um, we talk, we have a whole lesson on fracking. So you should take that course if you want. Um, I don't want to too much detail on it right now, but um, yeah, there's a lot of natural gas extraction and fracking happening in the United States. Um, and, then, and this shows where those recoverable natural gas reserves are. So you can see that Russia, the US, China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, these are all top the list. But unconventional, which is, which is fracking essentially, unconventional natural gas extraction is dominating a lot of the extraction in places that hadn't previously been that high on this chart, like the US, China. Russia has always had a lot of natural gas, but not always of the fracking variety. All right. And of course, historically, this was all first utilized in the steam engine, Watts steam engine here, right, which is depicted in a number of different ways. Essentially, modern power plants that use fossil fuels operate almost exactly the way that a steam engine does. You have your fossil fuel, whether it's coal or oil or natural gas, and you burn it. It gets really, 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 really hot. You run water through a pipe over that burning coal that heats the water up so much that it turns to steam. The steam then pushes through the pipe and turns a wheel much in the way that water itself would turn a wheel, but steam is uh, reusable, right? So you can recondense it and then uh, do it again. You don't have to be on a river like you had to before. So now you can essentially bring the water wheel to your own, your very own factory in downtown London using coal. So here's just some history on, um, on, the, on the steam engine. I'm not gonna review all of this. Um, it kind of gives like more in detail description of uh, what was in the, the paper that you read. Here's a review on combustion. If you wanna remind yourself on how exactly uh, combustion works. Combustion is just oxidizing, adding oxygen to a fossil fuel, a hydrocarbon, burning it. And the burning produces water vapor and carbon dioxide and a lot of heat and that heat is what heats up the steam and there's a youtube video here so i'll post this um post this lecture so you can go, go through it yourself um so there's a youtube video on combustion and then this is a the, the modern power plant and i don't know why the background turned to black but i'll i'll, I'll revise this slide so you can see it. but it's essentially the steam engine on steroids um so not a lot of technology has changed in the last 200 years in terms of burning fossil fuels. All right, so um, this is a look at how much of these fossil fuels we have burned um, in terms of terawatt hours, and like how much energy in terms of hours was produced from each of these different sources. So you can see that coal was really the initial uh, jumping off point and then in the early 1900s and especially in the mid 1900s, the mid 20th century, that's when uh, oil really took off, the discovery of oil. And then it's been more recent that this, the fossil fuel usage has been dominated by natural gas, okay? And you can see how the rise has really essentially been exponential. And it doesn't look all that dissimilar from those graphs that you've seen 
of coronavirus spreading throughout the, the world, right? It's like starts off small and then it picks up, picks up steam, pun intended. Um, so so um, if we wanna just look at each of those um, separately by country, you can see really um, where these different fossil fuels are being consumed the most per capita, per person. So you can see that, for example, coal, it's really China, the US. Uh, Germany actually still consumes quite a bit of coal, Japan. Um, but oil is vastly different. So while the US is really at the top of almost all of these charts, um, the, the, the most oil in the world is really, really, really being consumed in the Middle East, especially in the UAE, where the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, very rich country, um, because of, of oil, because of its oil reserves. And then finally, natural gas. Um, this is natural gas consumption per capita. This doesn't really extend beyond 2015, which is when the fracking boom has, um, has really taken off. So you might see the US start to appear on this chart where we historically haven't been big producers and consumers of natural gas. But in the last literally 10 years, um, the fracking boom has, has transitioned our economy from coal to natural gas. In fact, one of Trump's promises in 2016 was to bring back the coal industry. That's totally a fruitless endeavor because the coal industry has been essentially replaced by the fracking industry, the natural gas extraction in the US. And there's not really anything that anyone can do about it because natural gas is cheaper. <clears throat> um, so when we add it all up together, um, there's some good news and some bad news. So here's the total carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel use by country across the world. And you can see that for some of the big uh, producers and users of fossil fuels, we have in fact leveled off. So the US, the, the European Union, uh, Russia, Japan, and now even China appear to have leveled off in their usage of fossil fuels. India is still increasing and much of the, the, the global south, for example, is still seeing rapid increase in their use of fossil fuels, but a lot of the big emitters of fossil fuel have in fact leveled off. And this is just in total amount of carbon dioxide produced from these various countries. When we break it down per capita, the news is actually even better a little bit. So you can see that the amount of carbon dioxide produced per capita, for example, in the United States, the blue line, has actually been steadily going down since the early 2000s. In Europe, it's been going down since 1990. Uh, Japan and uh, Russia, it's fairly flat. And even in China, you can see that in the last, you know, 10 to 20 years, it has really leveled off in terms of per capita usage. So there is some, some decently good, good news um, in terms of, you know, fossil fuel uh, usage. I will caution you, these data, especially for the US, a lot of the decline in fossil fuel usage in the US is because we've transitioned from coal to gas and gas is a little less dirty. So it's not necessarily that we're using less energy, it's just that we're using a, a cleaner type of fuel. So that's an also an important discussion point. Okay, <clears throat> the problem is that if you look at uh, sort of how much um, we've used, no, not how much we've used, how much more fossil fuels we can use to avoid catastrophic climate change, it's about a third of what's actually left. So a lot of people argue that we'll just run out of fossil fuels and that will solve climate change. That is not the case, right? So looking at this figure on the left here, the, the amount of fossil fuels still in the reserves, and this isn't even newly discovered stuff, this is just stuff that's already there, is more than twice, it's about three times as high as the amount that we can use, that we're allowed to use in order to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius. And we talked last week about the catastrophic climate change and all that. So we're not gonna run out of, of, of fossil fuels. That's not gonna be the great hope, the unicorn, okay? There's a lot of reserves left, even though we've burned a lot, there's still quite a bit left actually that will 
get us to that catastrophic climate change level. Okay, I'm just gonna skip ahead to some of these. I'll put these online so that you can kind of use them as, as reference. Um, but I do wanna, I do wanna end on a, on a positive note here. So even though we have an economy that's built on fossil fuel extraction, we have three times as many fossil fuels left in the ground as we are allowed to burn. There is hope, I maintain hope, that we can transition to a renewable economy. I recently read on Twitter this morning that um, there's like a new documentary that was produced by Michael Moore that shits on renewables. And I've read a lot of critiques of it. And so I haven't had a chance to watch it myself or look at the critiques in depth, but I would caution you that any documentary that shits on renewables is, um, I don't like it. That's my scientific opinion. Um, because I really do think there's a lot of hope in renewables. So let me just walk through the four main renewables that, that, there, that we have options for to transition our economy to. So first is solar. The sun is, uh, is there, it just went away, it's cloudy now here in Chicago, but the sun is there all the time and it's not changing. And this map shows where the most available solar uh, energy is located. So you can see like wherever it's red on this map shows the places where there is the highest potential for, for converting the energy grid to solar. So obviously like in the deserts and near the equator, but also like in the Southwest of the United States and Mexico, um, and the same thing across Central Asia here. I think more encouraging for me is across South, Southern Africa and parts of South America and Australia where there's abundant sun. And the cost of solar has gone down exponentially in the last decade. So we can actually erect very efficient uh, non-toxic solar uh, panels, solar farms, solar power plants, um, and we can use this map as a guide. There's a lot of sunlight out there that's able to be harnessed for, for uh, renewable energies. There's also a lot of wind. So the wind isn't going anywhere either. Um, this map shows the places where there is the highest potential for wind energy, and you'll notice that it doesn't exactly overlap with the solar. So there's potential for solar to be used where there's lots of sun, wind to be used where there's lots of wind, right? And you don't have to just pick one or the other. You go where the, where the resource is. So this map shows where there's a lot of wind energy. And so you can see the central center part of the United States um, all across the Northern latitudes. And they also show the coastlines here where there's always gonna be more wind power over the ocean because the ocean is flat, relatively flat, so there's not as much friction. Um, so there's a lot of wind um, in, for example, Northern Europe, uh, like Denmark, you know, Amsterdam, famous for wind uh, utilization, um, but also again in the Southern hemisphere, right? Southern tip of South America, the Southern tip of Africa, Australia, Australia is, uh, particularly a focus for a lot of this because Australia is like getting hit really hard by climate change, um, as we saw, and as well as Southern Africa, actually. Those are the two places that I think I always bring up a lot because they're, they're, they're bearing the brunt particularly hard. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for wind. So everywhere here on this map that's like green or above is like a place where there's adequate wind power that you could really erect a solar wind farm, uh, sorry, a wind energy farm that would be, um, that would be really uh, effective at transitioning to renewables. There's also um, the potential for geothermal power. So um, harnessing the energy of the littoral earth, the rocks sliding against each other, right? So this is located primarily where there are plate boundaries. Um, so again, the Western United States and all down the Andes Mountains, um, throughout much of equatorial Asia, for example, South uh, Asia and equatorial Asia, as well as the Mediterranean. Um, but then also interesting is this Eastern Africa component here where you have actually the Great Rift 
Valley forming, a, a plate boundary actually forming on the crust in real time as we speak over, over millennia, uh, millions of years actually. Um, so there's a lot of power to be harnessed from geothermal potential. And then the last one is from the energy of the waves. So the ocean is dynamic and we can harness energy from waves, from the waves in the ocean, right? Um, and so this map shows where that energy, the highest potential is from that energy, the reds, the oranges, the purples, the, or the, the maroons, these are the places where there's the most energy that's available from wave energy. So if you take the sun, the wind, the rocks, and the waves, that sounds like a band, actually. The sun, the wind, the rocks, the waves, a song or something, I don't know, a movie. Maybe I'll make a movie. That'll be what I do, I just, my new career. Um, if you harness all those, there's really no, I see a lot of people laughing, but because you all are on mute, it's like really funny. <laughs> anyway, um, my jokes are especially bad today. I've had four cups of iced coffee that my friend made me, so that's where we are. Anyway, if you harness the wind, the sun, the waves, and the rocks, there is boundless potential for transitioning our economy from the uh, fossil fuel extraction, exploitative labor practices that have defined it thus far to a future that uses renewables that is more, uh, more just for all laborers, that doesn't rely on fossil fuels, blah, 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 blah. blah. So that's kind of the end of this little part of the lecture, but I would love to have like a little discussion if any of you have, have thoughts on that. Let me just, uh, let me just like stop recording so that um, people can talk, talk freely. Or maybe I wasn't actually recording at all. Where's my, where is the screen? Oh, there it is. Stop recording.